So our next keynote is a video keynote. And this is going to, the title is Perspectives from the Deputy National Security Advisor. Now, why am I the one introing this? Um, so Ann Neuberger is the one who's giving us the video keynote. Her title is Deputy Assistant to the President um, and Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber and Emerging Technology. There's a lot there. However, I'm introing her because she and I used to work together. And Anne was at NSA as a director of CSD, where for those of you who are here this morning, she uh, had Rob Joyce's job before. And she was recruited to come over to the White House and for a first of its kind position. So she and I worked together on Operation Warp Speed, where we were tasked with helping to defend the vaccine, along with a bunch of other activities. And she is one of my favorite people to work with. She led an amazing team. And I'm always really excited when I see a White House press conference and there's Anne up at the podium. Because having cyber play that role and the importance within an administration and our government is absolutely critical. So I've been thrilled to see that role on the NSC. And I'm thrilled that Anne was able to put together this video. She is one of the busiest people I have ever met. And while she would have loved to be here with us, um, I guess POTUS won out on that one, which is fine. I'll get over it. Um, but she was able to put this together. So join me in welcoming Anne, and I hope you enjoy this video. Thanks. Hello, everyone. It's really good to be here today with all of you at Vanderbilt University and particularly great to be here um, in speaking with really somebody who's been such a close colleague through a number of challenging initiatives, Brett Goldstein. Brett and I worked together during his time running the Department of Defense Digital Service as he worked to bring innovation to some of DOD's hard problems. DOD is a very large organization and the purpose of that organization was to say, when we have a truly hard problem that needs technical and sometimes policy innovation. It needed an individual like Brett, Brett's skill and knowledge, but also access to leadership of the department to really be able to push those initiatives through. So you should ask him about initiatives he's done on the COVID side and related to that that are really terrific to hear about. I got to know Brett in my own role at NSA, where I was responsible for creating, standing up an organization that worked NSA cybersecurity mission. NSA has had a cybersecurity mission since its inception, essentially building the cryptography that underpins the nation's most sensitive systems. Think nuclear command and control, think our military capabilities that connect satellite systems, ship systems, and a soldier, sailor, or airman in a challenging place in the world. But increasingly, we know that our cybersecurity mission needs to go beyond encryption and strong technology and integrate intelligence regarding adversaries' capabilities regarding adversaries' targets, what they care about, as well as regarding emerging technologies and how we shape those to ensure security is baked in at the outset. In bringing those communities together at the National Security Agency as we stood up at Cybersecurity Directorate, a big part of that was encouraging individuals to talk about outcomes and to see how each of their outcomes was more effective when intelligence was linked with operations, when individuals with network skills were working closely with analysts who understood nuclear command and control, who understood a particular complex satellite system. That linking of people from different backgrounds crossing technology, policy, and law is truly at the root of advancements in the emerging technology and defensive and offensive cyberspace. And it's one of the things I'm truly excited to talk about when we discuss the kinds of programming at Vanderbilt to build and train individuals who can truly lead the United States and global policy in this space. Brett asked me to talk about a couple of other roles that have shaped my thinking in this area. So I'll mention two. One was, I was privileged to co-lead with a tremendous colleague at, the, at Cyber Command, the U.S.'s um, operations in 2018 to defend the 2018 midterm elections, which included a range of defensive efforts as well as a range of activities to disrupt plans by particular adversaries to 
um, influence the U.S. elections. Those were the first such operations by the U.S. And again, bringing together those two cultures and having those communities talk, we saw the magic of what that brought together. Talking about the role of the Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber and Emerging Technology, President Biden recognized that cyber and emerging technology underpin geopolitics around the world in the 21st century, and that to truly be able to drive both the coordination of the many parts of Team Cyber in the United States, our law enforcement mission, our resilience mission led by CISA, our intelligence mission, our treasury mission, right, fighting the illicit use, for example, of cryptocurrency that underpins ransomware, to really bring and coordinate those roles together required a role at the White House as part of the National Security Council, whose job it is to integrate the entire interagency. And the role, interestingly, focuses on both cyber, our defensive and offensive cyber policy, as well as emerging technology, because in some ways, the challenges we face in cyber today are because we rapidly digitized our infrastructure to get the amazing benefits of tech and didn't necessarily have the opportunity to consider cybersecurity baked in from the ground. So we want to apply those lessons as we shape the benefit, gleaning the benefits of emerging technologies, baking in security. What do I mean? For example, the president's bipartisan infrastructure law is making major investments in bridges and roads um, and other physical infrastructure in the United States. We want to build those smart. So for example, including sensors and bridges to detect if a load is too heavy and may cause a bridge to collapse. We also know that we need a framework to integrate those sensors and ensure a malicious attacker couldn't use that information either to block the info coming off the sensors to a control system or to change the information to give, for example, false emergencies or false alerts. So that's what we mean when we talk about emerging technology. Another area in that space I'll talk about a bit more later is quantum, where we know that a potential adversary acquiring a quantum computer could have real implications for our defensive um, ability, which is all underpinned by a type of cryptography that could be, um, that could be weakened and attacked by a quantum computer. So that's the goal President Biden had in establishing the role I play um, and really in integrating that team. I'm privileged to be integrated to all of our discussions here at the National Security Council, whether it's Russia, Ukraine, whether it's China, whether it's digital development and international economic development. I bring that perspective in from individuals working cyber and tech around the US government and of course, our close partnership with the private sector. The department, the, the Biden administration has three parts to its cyber strategy. One, rebuild at home, modernize our defenses. Two, lead on the international stage. Recognize that in a world of global communications, collective defense, where a threat to one is a threat to all, must be our approach. And finally, ensure our posture to compete, that we have effective capabilities in offensive areas, we have effective capabilities in emerging technologies to ensure we can maintain global U.S. leadership in, and in innovation and, of course, in protecting our national interests abroad. You may ask me, when we think about how we rebuild at home, what does that mean? You've seen what the Biden administration has done in its first year. Very significantly, an executive order the president issued last May, which uses for the first time an incredibly powerful tool the power of U.S. government procurement of technology. We spend billions of dollars across U.S. government on tech. And we know we have a strategic goal. Tech companies, companies need to build security in from the design stage. And they need to be accountable for the security of tech, maintaining it, patching it. Too often today, that responsibility is pushed to the user. The user is responsible to configure it correctly. The user is responsible to maintain it. And in our executive order, we put in place a requirement that any software the U.S. government buys must be built and deployed in accordance with a new set of NIST standards that were developed over the last nine months in close partnership with the private sector. The executive order also puts a number of practices in place to ensure coherence and coordination across the federal government in responding to incidents, as well as working closely with the private sector, learning from incidents that occurred 
establishing the equivalent of a national traffic safety board post a major cybersecurity incident to learn from that. A second part of Rebuilding at Home has been a focus on critical infrastructure. We did a broad policy review to see what were current U.S. government agency regulatory authorities for critical infrastructure, because we know that the critical services Americans rely on, that we all rely on, from water to power to communications, must have minimum standards of security to ensure that we've locked our digital doors and made it harder for even a sophisticated attacker to attack. When we did that review, we discovered that in some sectors, we had authorities we weren't using, and in others, we have significant gaps. An example of the first, following the significant hack by criminal actors of Colonial, Ram of Colonial Pipeline, we said, we need to review and see what authorities we actually have to ensure there are minimum cybersecurity standards in place for the nation's most critical oil and gas pipelines. And we discovered that TSA actually had emergency authorities to mandate that. So they quickly issued an emergency directive this past summer that by January 2022, practices had to be in place. Minimum cybersecurity standards, an incident response plan, a convening of an exercising of that plan. So today, as I talk with you, as, even as we look at potential significant Russian threats to critical infrastructure, we have the confidence that there are some minimum practices in place and a way to mandate additional practices for oil and gas. And we know that that kind of framework and approach is what we need in each of our critical infrastructure sectors. We've engaged with partners around the world. Australia recently passed recent legislation to learn from their approaches and to think through how we put in place practices that are respectful of each sector's differences. We don't need a one-size-fits-all approach. We want to be, we know that an approach in banking is different from an approach in energy. We know that an approach in pipelines is different from an approach in water because those sectors are made up differently and they use different technology. So it's looking at each sector and ensuring that the leads for that sector have the authorities they need to have the visibility and the minimum standards in place to give us all the confidence that our critical services cannot be disrupted. So that's what we talk about when we talk about rebuilding at home. When we talk about leading on the international stage, you may have seen in October, the White House convened 35 countries around the world for a counter ransomware initiative. And that ransomware initiative had five components that we saw as critical to fighting ransomware, countering illicit use of finance, resilience, disruption of ransomware individuals and networks, public-private partnership, and critically, diplomacy. Engaging with countries who were serving and providing um, respite and allowing um, ransomware actors to operate from their countries. Most importantly, what we did in convening that group was saying the U.S. will be a leader in the world on cybersecurity issues. While we did the convening of bringing countries together to fight this common fight, and it is indeed a common fight, whether it's Irish healthcare systems, Japanese companies, or a Swedish supermarket chain. Ransomware is proving that collective defense is needed. We ensured that other countries led each of those five pillars to demonstrate that we want to be collaborative leaders and bring others in and really work these issues arm in arm. A second example of leading on the international stage has been our work to really partner with Ukraine to significantly increase their cybersecurity. In the roll-up to the invasion, as we saw the threats increasing, we worked with Ukraine virtually to ensure the Department of Energy was plugged into their energy providers, given the prior experience with Russia's disruption of Ukraine's energy grid. That partnership enabled Ukraine to disconnect from the Russian electricity grid and reconnect to the European Union one, removing a key risk. It's truly hard to secure a grid when it's linked up with the Russian grid. In addition, we pass regular information, and we've worked closely to connect U.S. companies providing services like counter DDoS services and endpoint detection services to ensure that Ukraine could, building on its prior five years of work, rapidly protect itself in the case of the significant cyber attacks we've seen from Russia, multiple different types of destructive attacks. When we talk about Ukraine, we often think about NATO. And in the run-up to the conflict and the further invasion of Ukraine as well, 
I took two trips to NATO to address the North Atlantic Council, the group of NATO countries, about cyber issues, and to talk about the fact that while historically NATO was a partnership focused on military, physical capabilities, and now needed to include hybrid cyber and counter disinfo capabilities as well. And that as we shifted to fighting hybrid fights, we needed to mature and advance the new NATO cyber policy we issued the summer before, the first time in seven years, and really bring our capabilities to bear and operationally exercise them together, fitting cyber into planning, operations, and post-after action reviews. There are significant lessons learned from this in that because different members of NATO have different levels of capability, we know that the core countries who do have counter disinfo and cyber capabilities not only need to work together, but can also teach a great deal and help lift up capabilities across NATO. As we've seen cyber play a significant role in the Russian invasion, in the degree of destructive attacks Russia has conducted, and the degree to which that sets precedent on international norms, we know that, first of all, having a NATO capability to respond to an attack against a NATO country, as you know, Ukraine is not a NATO country, really requires planning now, building capability now, so that we can quickly respond, both in managing the response to the incident, but also in determining the consequences for irresponsible state behavior that violates international norms. As we look to the future and to the threat landscape and what we need to focus on, those three components of our strategy are very much close at hand. I'll talk for a moment about the emerging technology space. You may have seen an executive order that the president signed out on digital assets just about a month ago. It focuses on a number of areas related to cryptocurrencies. Should the United States have a central bank digital currency? Building on several of those, notably China, that are already in place around the world. And what are the implications for our financial system? What are the implications for our national security system? For example, the use of sanctions and how potential greater use of cryptocurrency could minimize the U.S. approach to use the dollar system to impose sanctions. How do we ensure our innovation, maintaining our role in global innovation and global standards to shape this world, to ensure they reflect our values of protecting privacy, while also enabling use of digital assets in all the creative ways people are thinking about? The president recently signed out an executive order on quantum that begins the U.S. government's transition to post-quantum cryptography. And we're looking at a whole other set of areas related to emerging technology, baking security in at the outset. Everything starts with good people. People who have a background, a training, and experiences to take on these new areas. These are really areas that are very much on the front lines where we see the path ahead, but there's a great deal of work that needs to be done in order to bring together the components of technology, policy, and law to ensure that the policy we put in place, the operational practices we put in place, not only represent the best of what tech can do, but also represent our values of who we are as a country, a country that respects civil liberties and privacy, a country that works around the world to ensure that our approaches are interoperable as a global leader, and a country that ensures that we're allowing for diversity of perspective and thought and spreading the, be the benefits of tech and digital approaches to people around the world and, frankly, in all parts of the United States. One of the coolest parts, in fact, I think, of the President's bipartisan infrastructure law is the investments in broadband, ensuring that if you didn't grow up in Brooklyn, as I did, but maybe living, as Brett does, in the mid-Midwest, far from uh, a large city, you still have access to quick broadband. You can still benefit from massive open online courses in the best universities in the world or selling your cool art products all around the world as well. So what are the areas we need to be creative in as we think about training programs? I'll give a shout out to Brett for the dual grad degree he did in computer science and public policy at the University of Chicago. And I think building on that, degrees that bring together legal and technology training. So for example, one of the areas grappling with is UAVs 
in the United States, how do we prevent an adversarial or criminal use of UAVs domestically? We need to be looking for them, but how do we balance that with rules and appropriate laws against domestic monitoring? How do we consider AI and privacy? AI can allow for such advancements, for example, in the medical field, where you may have a very small number of cases around the world with a mutation of cancer, and you want to bring together the results of drug tests to see people's reactions. How do you do that in a way that protects their privacy? That requires linking policy and tech at a really deep level. So those are areas that we need to think about. As well as we think about academic research or think tank work, some of the areas that I'd love to see more work in that I know my, myself and my team would eagerly review to see those thoughts is first, we always have concerns about regulation because sometimes it ends up setting almost a, a maximum ceiling on what will be put in place and creates a compliance culture, a check the box culture. On the other hand, as I mentioned with critical infrastructure, if we don't have minimum standards in place, we often see that the companies operating critical infrastructure don't do what is needed to ensure their systems, their digital doors are locked and their systems can be defended. So how do we put in place standards that are performance-based, that are outcomes-based, that don't become a ceiling, but become an effective floor so we have confidence that there are minimums in place across the critical infrastructure we rely on? Similarly, in the international policy space, at the UN, countries signed off on a governmental group of experts set of norms for responsible state behavior in cyberspace. One example of that is that um, countries will not harbor actors targeting cyber, conducting cyber attacks, targeting critical infrastructure, for example. We now need to shift to implementing those norms. How do we do so? How do we do rapid attribution? What are appropriate proportionate consequences of, of countries who violate those norms? We need good thinking in that area. And then similarly, how do we verify that those norms are in place? For example, as we seek to potentially discuss bilateral agreements with countries on the set of practices we will not do on each other's critical infrastructure. So really looking and excited for work in that space. In closing, a thank you to all of you for the work that you're doing it's truly exciting to see that work. There are complicated challenges ahead, but I'm excited to think about the partnerships between government, private sector, and academia in working together to come up with effective approaches that bring the best of who we are as a country, the best of who we are, each of us, as people, towards these hard problems. There's truly nothing, as I think about my own background for a moment. My father came to America as a refugee from the Communist Soviet Union. And broadly, my grandparents were survivors of, a, of, of the Holocaust, right? Where we saw the evils that individuals can do. When we look at technology, technology can make all of our lives better. Technology can also come with real risks. Facial recognition can pinpoint individuals to pursue them. The data we now have can pinpoint individual vulnerable groups to allow for targeting in dangerous ways. We can also use technology to protect against that. I'm looking to all of you to help us with that. Thank you.